Hello, and um, hello, all you drawdown errs. Um, I'm here today. I'm Edwina von Gall, founder of the Perfect Earth Project, and I'm here today with Abby Lawless, landscape architect, and Tony Piazza, landscape contractor, to talk about our responsibility as individuals in terms of what we each could do that's really significant actually on our own properties so um one of the things just to give you a little context i'm so happy that this conference is talking about the role of the individual because it's always been something that i thought was a little bit missing from a lot of the dialogue because there is a lot we can do and it isn't necessarily making a donation or signing another gosh darn petition it's in our yards and it's in your heart then once you're doing it in your yard we are right now um losing a biodiversity and it's taken a while for the scientific community to actually start to incorporate this idea that biodiversity loss is a critical component of climate change because it's hard to quantify and it's a little bit hard to make the connection but it's it's very real if we don't stop our biodiversity loss the the improvements that we make in our carbon capture will ultimately not be what they need to be to keep the human species alive um right now we're losing species at a rate of about a thousand times the natural rate which adds up to one to five per year, which doesn't sound like a lot, but we've lost uh, our mammal, bird, and fish populations are down by 60% in the last 40 years. And I know um, many of you are aware of the fact that our birds are down by about 3 billion in, in North America alone, which is about a third of their population. At this rate, we will probably lose about 30 to 50% of all species by the middle of this century. And that's animals. Plants are, are disappearing at a much larger rate. People tend to be a little plant blind, so you don't hear a lot about that. But that, of course, is the one that we are primarily going to focus on as plants as the foundation of everything. Uh, we So the ways that are directly related landscaping to, to uh, climate change are often in our use of gas-powered engines. We use about, it's a big spread, for 16 to 41 billion pounds of CO2 per, per year come out of landscape equipment used in the United States alone. And that's mostly mowers. That doesn't even count the blowers, which we know are extremely bad. So um, in order to address this, we, are looking at a problem that is primarily caused by loss of habitat and use of pesticides. So this is something that Perfect Earth has been talking about for a while now. And so it was just an ideal for us to step into this dialogue. Loss of habitat is happening as every time we build a new home and we put a landscape in that does not take the lives of non-human species into account and this is pretty standard so and i'm i call it earth ethics that in terms of earth equities so how what kind of equity diversity and inclusion are we thinking about when we don't think about the non-human lives and are we sharing our yards with non-human lives and all other species on earth and the answer is generally no we feel free to whack off you know, send in pruners, whack off branches, remove massive amount of leaf surface. But if a bug takes a bite out of a leaf, we call in the sprayers and kill them. That is not logical responses. So we're here to talk about what logical responses are and how we as individual decision makers on our own properties and in our communities can to completely revolutionize the way we look at land, the way we manage land, the way we live with our land. And most of it has to do with what we call nature-based landscaping. So na nature-based address is, is using practices that follow those that were established by nature. So it's kind of like, what would nature do? In any given situation, what would nature do? So if, um, like, what did nature do before humans started altering things? 
we tend to look at our landscapes the same way we look at agriculture. In other words, we're treating them as extractive. But what if you didn't extract? What if you take nothing away, just like nature? The leaves fall where they fell. It all goes back into the soil and is taken up again by the plant. So if we don't necessarily have to do it exactly in the same place because our job is to kind of add the aesthetic. We want a, a place where we can play and enjoy and look outside. And, um, and we like, and it's fun to do as well. So you're engaged that way. So the habitats that, as I said, as, as we increasingly build more houses and create more landscapes, we want to make sure that those landscapes are providing a minimum of ecosystem service. And Doug Tallamy provided a, a statistic that then spawned a campaign that we at Perfect Earth are promoting, and I call it Two Thirds for the Birds. And it's based on his um, findings that 70% of a landscape needs to be native plants and no pesticides in order to meet the basic requirements of wildlife in any given place. So. 70% is around two thirds and that rhymes with birds. So um, I started two thirds for the birds to raise the challenge to all of us who, can, who are making decisions about what's going on in our landscapes, primarily professional landscape designers and landscape architects to never ever again design or build a landscape that doesn't at least meet the basic needs of birds and other wildlife. And it's pretty darn simple because you can still have one third exotics, not good to have invasives. So you might want to remove the invasives, but one third exotics is quite a bit. So we're not suggesting that you go in and rip out everything that's on your land right now. It's more about starting to add natives and reduce the size of your lawn and replace it with more native plants. So it's just more fun and watch what happens. In the process, what you're doing is closing the loop. So it, it, the idea, of non-extractive landscape is that you, you don't send anything off site. Nothing goes to the landfill. Landfills are now contain about 20 to 50% of their content is landscape materials. They call it landscape waste. It is so not waste. <laughs> it is the food your property made for itself. And so feed it back to your land. Don't throw it away. In fact, pay for someone to take it away and then buy something foreign back that your property isn't even gonna like recognize and it's gonna have to do a lot of work to process it, to bring it back into the loop. So the food loop or food web is this constant cycling of nutrient. If we can't close the loop on our landscapes, how are we gonna close the loop on the earth? Because it is one container and continually extracting and dumping things elsewhere is just draining it all down. So number one, on, on your property, the first thing that we suggest that you do after you make a commitment to doing this, which means in tell your property, I will do you no harm. And from this moment on, I'm going to make a promise to you, property, that I will never put another pesticide or, or synthetic chemical on your soil or on your plants and kill your life forms. And I will plant two native plants for every three. And I will then learn from there and watch it happen. I'll also take out invasives. So the first part, the first action you can do with that is stop taking your grass clippings away, leave them on the lawn. If there are places where they're maybe a little messy, those you can rake to the side. But if you're doing it properly, they will disappear by the end of the day. Don't mow your lawn when it's just been irrigated. <laughs> mow it dry and let them, they'll fluff around and go back in. Um, use a mulching mower and it goes even faster. Leave your leaves. There's a lot happening now in the world of leaving your leaves. And hopefully you're already experimenting. It's not always easy. Sometimes you have a lot of leaves and you have to figure out what to do with them. And so come to Perfect Earth and we'll give you some ideas and try to keep putting information out about that. And every, but every branch, everything that you take out of your landscape, that take from the plants in your landscape should stay on the property. And as I said, there are lots of wonderful ways that you can explore with doing this. 
minimal pruning, leave standing dead trees. Those are snags. That's where birds live. Those are bird feeders. Leave dead wood in trees. As long as it's not going to fall in your car or your playset, leave it there. It's, it's, a, it's an endangered habitat. That's where bugs live. And so, let me just, and don't, and then anytime, if you want to remove a weed or you think you should kill a pest, don't do it so you can say its name. If you can't name it, how do you know you're not killing something like an endangered species that you've just created this wonderful space? And how do you know you haven't just invited an amazing species into your property? And, and then you're gonna kill it? That, that's not logical. But, and most of the time, if you wait, the, the beneficial insects, if you see something eating your tree, a tree can be completely stripped of vegetation for, for one season, it will grow back and it will not mind. Most trees, however, can totally handle, they're, they're, they're designed to give back to nature 10 to 20% of their leaf surface every single year. And from August on, they're done with those leaves. The insects can have at them. So what we have done, so join us at Two Thirds for the Birds. Go to www.234birds.org www.234birds.org and sign our list to tell people that you've made the commitment and to join the community because we're asking the people in the community to share the fact that they're doing it. So landscape architects, landscape contractors, all manner of people practicing this are going to be sharing their information, their expertise and offering their services to you if you'd like to look for them there. So now I'm going to bring on Abby Clough Lawless, who is a landscape architect. And she, we've worked together uh, quite a bit through the years. And she has really taken on the ideas and the practices of nature based and is extraordinarily um, accomplished in making landscapes that are just gosh darn beautiful. And so she's the, like, the, she's the reason why shelling out for a landscape architect is worth it because there is it is it can be complicated it, it's always beautiful but you learn to let, let go but it can be also complicated if you want to take it to higher levels of plant communities and um design or if in, if you're in a hurry to get it done so um abby take it away thank you edwina let me share my screen uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm, ex uh, I'm excited to be here and, uh, you know, with my two favorite people, Tony and Edwina. Uh, landscapes, I'm sure you've all begun to realize um, that our natural world is quite complicated and interconnected. Um, and we as landscape designers um, are coming, have begun to uh, have changed, have evolved um, over the last last 10 years. There's been a lot of really beautiful and exciting work that's hap that's happening in our field. So and so when it comes to design, um, the first thing you need, should think about when you when you have your own personal property is where am I and knowing your place um, over in the past um landscapes you 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 were copying from you couldn't tell and still many landscapes are um have no place they have no reference they look the same if they're in chicago um or wyoming or um, new england uh the the aesthetic of the lawn and the meatball has kind of run its course and we're all very excited that it's passing <laughs> um when it comes to your place here in the east end um, it's, you know, we, we all are here because we love the, the land, we love the water, we love this place. Um, and so when you, when you look at your property, you should do um, some research and figure out where are you, what part, what part of what community are you, is your landscape part of. It has a past, it has a future, it's living, it's dynamic. And so, yes, your house is there, but you are part of something much bigger. Um, so 
you, you, one of the things we do, um, there's amazing amount of resources available now um, when it comes to natural planting and nature-based planting. And these are three of my favorites. Um, I also included a few uh, kind of places you could go for further research um, on both the, your local environment and also lo, um, how to's. Um, some, of these, some of these are really for professionals, but there's also just uh, evocative and beautiful and there's lots to love. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the High Line, um, which has introduced a somewhat naturalistic planting style with a lot of natives right in New York City. Pete Udoff is that man, and he's kind of the father when it comes to this natural style planting. And here's um, a project he did in Nantucket, which is very similar, has a very similar ecosystem to ours. Um, and you can see it's kind of a meadow style with um, some trees and shrubs. And then here's his very funky, but fun um, planting plan. Um, so when it comes to designing a landscape, um, it's complicated um, and run, um, and there are many layers. Um, some of the professionals that have done the best job kind of breaking it down is Claudia West and Thomas Rainier. And when you think of a planting, when you're thinking about your property and bringing it back to something that's um, alive and living and diverse, um, you can think of it, you can break it down into layers. So when you look at a field with a tree in it, it's more than just, it has three, three layers, ground cover, seasonal theme, which is like the flowers where you're seeing echinacea and liatris here, and then structure. So when we're looking at a landscape, we're looking um, at layers, uh, the layers of life. And we're, when we do a design, we're combining those. So let's see. So, you know, this, so when you are beginning to think about redesigning your property, there's a couple steps you need to take. Um, it can get quite in depth and complicated, but I'll, I'll just go over this quickly and we can post this if you're interested in the details. But the number one thing you have to do is change your perspective um, because you need to realize that you are part of a larger dynamic ecosystem. So in, instead of the four um, property or, you know, your, you know, your world, this land, wild world that you reside goes beyond your property border. So just starting there, looking big, understand that the land is living, that this is not something that doesn't change or grow. Your house will stay static, but the land is gonna keep changing and evolving and growing. And that's what makes it beautiful, evocative um, and all the things we love. Um, you need to think about your role um, on that land. And I like to think of it as a conversation. Like every day I walk outside in my pro uh, my little a lot and I, it's a conversation. I, I discover, I find, I revel, I see. There is a, and then an exchange. Oh, um, there's an exchange going on between you and the land. And then finally, you know, think of yourself as a land steward. You're, you're not a dictator, you're a caretaker. Um, and um, that you're here for a short time in this world and then the, the land will continue and you're part of that journey. Um, step two, listen and learn. There's, a, you know, I, our professionals, we, we, we're st we learn every day and that's one of the beautiful things about our profession um, is that I'm, I'm learning every single day about the ecology, about the area, about the wildlife. Um, and there's a very long journey and it never ends. Um, Step three, understand your place. So now you've, okay, you want to do a regenerative natural planting at your property. You have to understand your law in particular. How, what, where, what is where? Uh, where are the dry places? Where are the sunny places? Where is this, um, 
you know, all everything that that property has at its current existence. And then you can think about what you what what it needs to add. Um, as designers, we always, you know, start big. And so should you. So you start with a master plan. Think of the big picture. Think of your overall goals. Then give yourself time and uh, uh, the time to, and you start small, especially if it's, if you're doing this all on your own, start really small <laughs> um, and experiment. There's a lot to do. Um, step five, six, seven, and eight are about planting concepts. How do you how do you design a garden, a meadow, a planting? I won't go into big detail here because um, you know this is a short session, and but there are many things to think about when you're looking at your landscape structure. Um, in particular, how are things framed? How do they relate to the house? And then. Um, but when it comes to a plant, a specific planting itself, it has the three layers, as I showed you before. Um, so next, I'm going to move on to kind of what I do as a professional. Um, and this is a project I worked with Edwina on where we were asked to design a native um, garden for a client up in Martha's Vineyard. And um, this is a presentation we pulled together showing uh, a planting plan. Um, and where we here we were looking at time, time of bloom. So you can see the pathways. Um, and we then kind of outlined what plants we sim put a plant for each symbol and we symbolize what plants bloom when. Um, and then this is the total composition of the planting. Here's a little close up. You can see um, mainly the garden has an underlayer that brings it all together. And it's the hardy, diver, hardy uh, plants that kind of create kind of a soft, even feel to this kind of space. And you can see we have a plant list of a group of plants that kind of covered about 50% of this garden with just these five plants. Then we start looking at um, plants that will give you a little bit of a show and also give the insects and birds um, nectar and, and shelter. So we work June and July. August is the big heavy hitter in this garden, but we want to make sure that when you're thinking about your plantings that you go through the entire seasons, 12 months of the year. This place needs to be a garden for all, not just your three weeks in August. Um, and then here's the total composition of this diverse and then finally here's a picture of the very first year and it actually wasn't completed planting but you can you can see here that native plantings native gardens can be really even at their very beginning quite charming and um it's going to be a really fun show to watch change evolve and grow so fine um so out here things are changing and I have become very, and our team have become very interested in the possibilities beyond the big plastic gallon court. Um, there are some environmental concerns about that, obviously, but there's also, um, we're also finding that gardens are healthier when you plant small, as Tony will bring up. So here I'm showing you um, the, the different sizes of like perennials that you could put in the ground. Um, and then also, and our favorite, the landscape plug. And then this is showing that when you're thinking about your planting, you're gonna plant in a grid, which will soon infill. And it, what you're seeing here is a big plant and then little plants surrounding. Because the biggest thing you know with nature is that nature abhors a vacuum and nature wants to cover ground. There is no mulch in nature. There is no bark mulch in nature. So what we aim for here, this is Waldestina, like a wild strawberry um, with Sporobolus, is that plants create community and shelter with each other. Okay, here is um, a project we just did last summer. This is my team here, and we um, 
this was our a meadow edge area that we just planted and you can see we started doing some waves we did a in order this is a somewhat formal place so we kept uh the front with one type of grass um and then we uh mixed behind um often i know edwina has mentioned that you know a lot of when, when you start doing more wild landscapes people tend to be um they don't want it to look they're afraid of messiness one way to kind of keep messiness or like that perception of messiness at bay is to like in this case we did uh one kind of grass which gives it um, a consistent front and face and then let the wild kind of emerge behind um so in this uh so you can see over here that this we planted this june so late planting um july it started to fill in and by september it looks like it had always been there the great thing about plugs is that um it doesn't look like hair plugs there is no mulch in this garden this um they just intermix and grow and spread and um settle right in um and the other thing we've experimented in our uh in our firm is seeding meadows in particular where as um, we all know, meadows are a great source of diversity in life. And um, this client um, was the first client who ever opted to have no lawn. I've never had a client say no lawn. This property, it's very small, maybe uh, half an acre or three quarters of an acre. Um, and he, uh, the, we just opted to use decks and, well, I guess one mowed pathway through. That's it. It is a has become a delight and um, as you will see um, evolved into quite a big party. So we here we were in April, just getting rolling. We sowed, I think, in May, um, June, it's just starting to come up the seed mix that we created. And by July, it was pretty much full. You can see it was a little spotty. Planting takes patience. But really, this one took very little patience when it came down to it. So May 6 is when we sowed the seeds. July, um, we had an infill. Um, and then by August, it was like a yellow party. Like it was a little, a little much. We were all a little surprised. The Black Eyed Susan um, explosion happened. Um, but uh, boy, was it fun. And then I just I'm showing you different ways you can go about um, creating like a naturalistic planting area. And in here, we need we um, use the regular three gallon pots with a little bit of seed. And as you can see, even um, they're spaced 18 inches apart. And even by by the end of that, by that fall, we had this the most beautiful seed heads and beautiful garden, you know, meadow garden you've ever seen. And last, just one more project that I worked on this spring, which was really exciting. This was um, a tennis court, not my favorite um, place. I always feel play tennis at the club and have 60 by 120 foot of a garden or meadow if you can. But if you love your tennis, um, you can also um, create quite um, a vibrant system uh, planting around it. And in this case, we um, did the same thing that you, you saw in the earlier projects where we pl added plugs and seed and by um this i think this was september we had the most vibrant um diverse lovely living landscape around the tennis court and finally um i ending with just this shot of a project uh up in springs um and just coming rest changing back to the perspective like um we left these wild cherries right in place we planted around we seeded and planted around the base of these cherries and we have the most delightful playful entrance that you could ever um ever enjoy um and it takes no maintenance it makes one mow a year um and look what comes about when you kind of when when you start uh going with this more naturalist natural system you can might be able to even get um an eastern screech owl or two so um tony edwina so i end there 
Okay, thank you, Abby. That was totally fantastic. <laughs> thank you. And I know that everybody will have a lot of questions. So um, Abby will be posting a lot of this information on the Perfect Earth website, perfectearthproject.org in the next coming weeks. So uh, do check in with us if you want more information. You can always just write to me, Edwina, at perfectearthproject.org as well. And now I'm going to introduce Tony Piazza. Full disclosure, Tony is also a member of the Perfect Earth Board because about, uh, let's see, Perfect Earth started in 2012. And a couple of years after that, I met Tony and I asked him to work on a project with me to see what we could do. Does it really work without chemicals? Because everybody says it doesn't. And Tony said he'd give it a try. And by the end of one season, he said, that's it. I'm giving up chemicals. This is like how I, I don't want my, I don't want my staff exposed to these chemicals. I don't want to work with chemicals. This is a really interesting challenge. And so that was around 2015, I guess, Tony, we decided Tony's actually been in business for about 24 years, Piazza Horticultural based in Southampton. And um, he is a plantsman. That's the, that's the highest um, recommendation I could probably give anyone. So Tony, please tell us, what it's like from the perspective of a successful landscape contractor who is got more work than he could possibly handle doing landscapes with zero pesticides. Thank you. Thanks, Edwina. First, I have to wait for my head to deflate a little bit after that introduction. Um, <laughs> but yes, I am a, a landscape contractor and I have an, an interesting combination of skills in that I'm, I consider myself a horticulturist above all, and I have a little bit of design background. So um, I, I work nicely with other designers because we sort of bring everything to the table together for the final outcome, which is uh, a happy client. But um, I'm gonna kind of speak more to people as homeowners today, because if you're, if you're working with a designer and a really good contractor, we're supposed to watch out for you. But if you're watching out for yourself, I wanna bring up a couple of tips. Um, and I think like the biggest thing is when you go shopping for plant material, it, it, it's a daunt. I think when you're on your own and you're trying something for the first time, it's a little daunting when you go to the nursery. So um, first of all, I just wanna say, gardening should be nothing but pleasure. So have fun with it. You're going to make mistakes, plants will die most of them will thrive but just have fun with it no rules um the native plant um production is kind of slow to catch up with demand so when you go to nurseries you're going to find small pockets of plant material that's native and ready for you to purchase both for everything from grasses to flowers to trees um it's growing each year but there there definitely is some um demand that has to be met and it, it will be so um i just want to take i just wanted to talk about um just quickly if if you can when you're shopping for native plants try to find the what we call in the business the straight species that's a plant that doesn't have a fancy name after it it's just a tupelo it's not a tupelo wildfire um, the reason why I say that is because those are the plants that have sort of evolved with the birds and the bees and the bugs to, to help them and um, complete their life cycles. And sometimes when you start messing around with that natural selection and, and start selecting plant materials for different growth habits, you can mix it up. But um, the bottom line is just even if it is a cultivar, a hybrid just buy it and get it in the ground we need all of the plants in the ground that we can get as edwina mentioned um so a couple of pointers to look out for especially when planting trees it's something that we call root flare um if you if you look at a tree in a forest you'll notice that in, when the trunk is in the ground it doesn't come off at the ground like a lollipop stick in the ground you'll see the roots kind of flaring into the ground so if you can buy a plant that shows that in the container already, that would be great. But if nine times out of 10, you're gonna find that you have to go looking for the root flare. So um, when you, whether you're buying a plant that's in a, a burlap ball or in a pot, 
before you plant it, actually pull the soil away from the top, from the bottom of the trunk or the top of the root ball until you find those roots that are going out laterally from the trunk. It's also a good time to expose as much of the root system on the top as possible to look for what we call a girdling root. And that's a root that might be growing in a circular fashion around the trunk that over time will actually strangle that plant and potentially kill it. So go ahead, if you find any of those, go ahead and just snip them to release the pressure. And um, something that we were talking about earlier before this taping was that people tend to be afraid to cut plants, but, but don't be. Just go in there with reckless abandon. If you find a root that's going to endanger the plant long-term, feel free to cut it. They, they usually respond twofold with the amount of growth that they replace from being cut. Um, root flare, dealing with it. Kind of check my notes here. And, and the other thing is when it comes time to actually planting that tree, something that's super important is what we call muddling. So that is after you've dug the hole and you've got the plant in the hole ready to be backfilled, to backfill a little bit and add a lot of water, backfill more and add a lot of water until that water eventually just soaks into the ground. But what you're doing is eliminating any air pockets in the soil, which can be, you know, which could be the, the death of the plant because roots can't survive in air. Um, but it's also going to marry two different soils potentially. So you've got soil from a pot or from a nursery and a root ball and the soil on your property, and they're usually different. And muddling is going to help in enabling those two soil systems to come together so the roots can grow freely through them. Um, and then, of course, we wanna make sure that we're irrigating for establishment only. So most native plants evolved in their systems and the only irrigation that they get is from the natural rainfall. So when you're, when you're planting a, a, a young plant from a nursery into a new landscape, it needs a little help to get through summers, usually mo no more than um, two growth seasons of irrigation but only plan on irrigating for establishment. And I wanna, I, I really wanna expound on something that Abby brought up during her discussion is that, you know, the best way to grow an oak tree is from an acorn, but we, a lot of us don't have that time and patience. So we're going to buy a plant, but don't feel, don't feel compelled to start with huge plants, especially with trees. I, we've all three of us have found that sometimes the smaller plants that we start with establish better and, and hit the ground running and catch up with plants there that were planted at the same time and you can't tell the difference between the plant that was planted smaller and the plant that was planted larger within a few years so um that you know the real key is to just make sure you've selected the right plant for the right place and you've planted it properly and I just want to talk a little bit about um, maintenance, chemical-free maintenance in the landscape. Um, it all starts with good soil. And what, what I mean by that is that the soil that you're putting the plant into is right for, the, for the, the plant that you're putting into it, if that makes any sense. But like Abby said in the beginning of her conversation is look around you, um, make sure that you're observing the plant material that's going to do well where you are because um, that's gonna set everything up for success and you for happiness. Um, a little bit about irrigation. Um, there's, we're, we're advocating through Perfect Earth to, to not irrigate often, irrigate seldomly and irrigate heavily. And like I said, with tree plantings, once they're established, you can remove irrigation completely. But um, you know, every landscape wants at least a little area bug of lawn. If you're taking care of that lawn and irrigating it, don't irrigate it every day. Irrigate it only as needed and irrigate it deeply. Um, I want to bring up one, just one quickie that we talk about in the business is mulch volcanoes. Mulch with plants, not with chopped up wood. And especially don't mount it up around the trunk of a tree. It's, it's bad for the tree and um, will eventually create those girdling roots that we talked about earlier. 
Um, let's see. It, we talked, to, I, I also wanted to talk about sort of balancing aesthetics and sort of predetermined norms for landscape maintenance that we all have. And one of the one of the things that we talk about a lot in at Perfect Earth is leaving the leaves. So get used to letting your leaves drop naturally and collecting into corners because they actually um, will give back everything that they took from the soil and build build it back to where it was and also protect a lot of um, overwintering insects and good bugs and protect the tree roots. So leave the leaves is just one of them. And um, a quick note on maintain, meadow maintenance. Um, Abby's probably the queen of meadows as far as I'm concerned. And one of the things when it comes to meadow maintenance is people like to mow them in the fall. Um, the best thing to do, and it's what we do on all of our properties, is the, the meadows get mowed as lately, as late as possible in the in the spring, um, just before that new growth starts because a lot of our endangered pollinators and insects are actually overwintering in the lower part of that meadow stubble. Um, that's it for now. I, I want to kind of move quickly into the conversation part of this because I think that's where people are going to glean a lot of information. Um, one last note is if, if, you, if you can't hire skilled people to do your landscape maintenance, if you are hiring people to do landscape maintenance, start demanding that the people that are working for you can provide toxic free landscape maintenance encourage them to get educated encourage them to talk to the people at perfect earth so that i'm not as busy as i am now <laughs> and with that i'll um turn it back over to edwina for a little roundtable discussion Thanks, Tony. Okay, Abby, come back on, unmute, and um, thank you both. That that was just so great. Tony, actually, uh, I want to uh, continue with you a little bit. So one of the things that um, we also talk about is about landscapes designed for dependency. But this isn't so much the actual, I mean, it is, some of it is the design by the designers, so I want you both to chip in on this, and some of it is the way it works as a business model in which we are watering and fertilizing, pushing fast growth. That growth is highly susceptible to insects and it also fills out trees. Then they come back and sell a pruning contract, right? So then you're taking the leaf surface away. So then you have to fertilize to, to, for the tree to compensate. Then um, oftentimes pruning, every pruning cut is a wound. So that opens the tree onto regular um, susceptibility to uh, infestation by more insects or maybe disease. And this cycle never stops, it's extracting, wounding, replacing. And when trees are pruned, like the whole inside of a tree is pruned out regularly, all the sucker growth is removed, then that tree is weakened, that, that tree needed those leaves, and all the weight ends up the ends, and then they come back and cable your tree because the, it's no longer structurally sound. So what do you think uh, number one, like I'm asking landscape owners to be on the lookout for this, but I'm also asking you, Tony, how could the landscape industry respond? Because they sometimes can say, well, you're taking our business away. My feeling is it's not ethically really correct to harm the earth as a business model. So what do you think, what would you tell them about the, about like changing so that they they have a perfectly good business without this constant cycle laying and cycle of dependency. Yeah, I think, you know, I ran into that in the beginning as well, because it, the, the, the landscape industry, landscape maintenance industry is sort of set up to run on schedules and routes and timing with that are easy to program and easy to schedule and easy to invoice. Um, it, it's just basically, a, shifting your your way of thinking about how this works and and sort of working more with the plants and with the seasons and in, in providing services as they're needed um i i don't it's 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 kind of tricky to explain but it's it's just not the the work will still be there believe me if there's if anything it's there's a little more work in the beginning but 
the the work happens as it's needed as it unfolds by nature it's not something that's necessarily programmable that's a really great answer abby what do you think that um landscape design professionals could do differently or what do you think they're doing now that that feeds into the cycle of dependency and what should they be doing differently uh well they're designing um often um, kind of with an antiseptic kind of uh, palette. Um, so uh, there's never any space for like keeping leaves, keeping compost. Um, the planting compositions are um, structural. They're not about living. It's almost like they're creating um, an Im uh, Im immobilized kind of I don't know like when you when you just do a boxwood garden boxwoods are beautiful I use them but um, if you're creating outdoor rooms that are uh, that require cleaning all the time then um, you're just creating an, an extractive situation where everything if everything needs to be mown blown clipped um, and uh, shaped to stay immobile a certain size a certain uh density then um you know you're in that cycle dependent cycle if you design um a planting that will grow and change so you do a diverse um planting that has um certain you know the, the it's a plant community that co-evolves together um then you can um leave it um and there's far less maintenance involved once you have a healthy system that um that where plants have, that have always evolved together are together like for instance meadows uh, might cost more in the front end get established but over the long term are you know are less extractive more life-giving and um you're you can leave you know everything you know it, it's just uh more dynamic and fun but uh yeah so kind of lost my thought there <laughs> But it's about it's, it's, it's a bit of a different framework. Yeah. Yeah. So um, one of the sort of sayings in our world is that um, that nature based landscapes are a process, not a product. And so um, and, and I think the same thing is about a landscape design is not a product that like people expect that their house is done, their interior is done, and they want to show up and see their landscape done. And then every time they come out to their house on the weekend, they kind of want to see their landscape exactly the same. And 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 we're and our how do we break that? Like that that's the wrong model because your landscape should be growing. But talk a little bit about like this idea of process over product. Well, what are the pro um let's see one of my favorite activities is walking a walking a landscape with a client and and kind of showing them with new eyes what's going on and what what they're seeing um you know something that might appear somewhat messy oh well look there's um monarch there's monarch butterfly hidden uh hidden there or um yeah the Yeah, the the whole process of um, is it's educational in some ways. Um, we there's so much delight to be found in um, a, na a native and natural landscape that is not found in an in, you know like these static landscapes. Um, so, so Tony, you know, sometimes sounds like really complicated that you need a guide. So. For, you must work for people who don't have a landscape designer. And um, maybe you could just, we're, we're getting really close to the end here, um, but not, oh, we have a little more time. So just about like, what can people do on their own? And maybe what we should be expecting from landscape contractors and or your gardener to um, help you do, but where do you think people can look at these processes on their own? And, and how can they understand the uh, a little bit more and feel more comfortable with a landscape that is a little has a mind of its own, you know, that you're allowing nature to make decisions for you, but you don't really know much about it. And you don't know it is this going out of hand or not? Is this going where where is this taking me? 
How do people yeah. manage that? You know, I think the best thing for people to do uh, any on any level, homeowner doing it on their own or or someone hiring a designer and a contractor, get out into nature and observe it. Watch and, and go into those same areas five times throughout the season and, and look at the moments that you capture throughout the season. Like, like you said, a landscape isn't static. It's constantly changing and you should celebrate moments. I, I just have a, a very funny anecdote I want to bring into this conversation. And the pandemic forced a lot of people out of the cities and into the rural areas. So in the spring of 2020, I get a phone call from someone saying, what is this pink tree in my front yard? It's gorgeous. And, and you know when did you plant it i've never seen it before and i said oh that's a magnolia it's been there since the house was built and they're like oh my god it's so beautiful and i'm so glad to you know to have it in the landscape two weeks later the same person calls back and said you have to come over the magnolia is dead and and i said no it's not dead it's just the flowering season is over and she's like well i want something there that's going to be that color all the time and i said no no you're going to learn to wait for that magnolia to come into bloom and celebrate it when it is you're going to sit outside and have a glass of wine and celebrate your magnolia and magnolia season so to bring this full circle like you look for those moments in your garden on every level uh, with the smallest grasses up to the biggest trees and let it let nature do its thing and and celebrate along with it that's that's a really great idea. And I, I love didn't the answer idea. your question, though, did I? Well, yeah, it did. I mean, I think that really that is a, it, it's a core thing is go into nature, go to the places like Abby on the map says you're in this area. Can you find hopefully some remnant of nature that expresses what the place would have been in your own little your ecosystem, wherever you are? It doesn't matter where you are in the United States. Like your property was once part of an ecosystem. And can you find what that ecosystem is? Find a representation of it in some in a preserve nearby. And I always just, I call it copy that. You know, take a picture of a moment in that landscape that just grabs your heart and sit down with it, find out what, take it to the, the to the to your garden center, find out what those plants are and put them in your property. I mean, obviously if it's a wetland and you don't have a wetland on your property, you have to be a little more selective. There are some really great websites. Um, you can Google them, but Audubon has a very nice one for helping you select native plants by your zip code. It's not particularly huge, which I think is kind of great because the selections on that site are ones that you're probably likely to find when you go to your local garden center and it's not going to be overwhelming they are going to attract insects that will attract birds and feed birds um one my my other statistic is that a chickadee needs over twenty thousand caterpillars to raise enough young to maintain its a healthy population and a chickadee only flies about a quarter of a mile from its nest the, the less the better because it's a lot of wasted energy because baby chickadees as like 90 percent of our songbirds need to feed caterpillars to their young they're not choking down big seeds and they provide incredibly important um, nutrients so if you're not providing twenty thousand dollars twenty thousand dollars twenty that too twenty thousand caterpillars <laughs> you're not even supporting one family of chickadees not even one and so if you get your feeder out there and you want to see a lot of chickadees think about that and um so any other comments that you think like are really important for what people should do just to get started or where we're going with this? I have to say Perfect Earth Project is about to initiate a very ambitious training program for the landscape industry and in hopes um, it will be online in a year or two so that there will be really great places that you can ask your landscaper to get um, knowledgeable i mean can you imagine a world in which you can talk to the guy who's out there mowing your lawn with his electric mower um that and your very small lawn it's like which of my plants is native and how is it doing is that plant all right i see it as a little bit of 
looks a little yellow and that person really has a knowledgeable response for you. We, as the land care industry, we owe that to your property. So Abby and after that rant, Abby and Tony. <laughs> No, yeah, but it's, it's, in the it is about community. It is very much about community and re-engagement, re-engaging with your your the land, and and it's going to bring great joy. And you know, so there's it's mutually beneficial. Yeah. Well, thank you both very much, and um, yeah. you can hopefully reach us if you have questions. PerfectEarthProject.org. Thanks and bye. Hey everybody. I I think we actually have Edwina, who's going to offer a few questions. Um, uh, oh, I see someone asking me to talk about deer. And that's a really good question, because then okay. always leads to ticks. Those are the two biggest things that people ask about. And um, deer are a problem. We all, I think everybody agrees on that. Uh, what we can't agree on is how to solve this problem. But since I'm a plant person, I'm hoping that someone somewhere will step in and bring some rational and careful thought to the problem. Meanwhile, deer are destroying the recruitment of our forests. They're destroying on the east end of Long Island where I garden. They have pretty much eaten most of the forbs so that the flowering population for our pollinators is seriously reduced. They are driving a lot of our native orchids and other ephemeral and, and more delicate wildflowers to the brink of extinction. We don't even know if they can ever revive. So I am a fan of fencing deer out. I recommend that you use fencing that has large openings at the bottom. So you are not excluding other wildlife that um, turtles don't get stuck in your fence and things like that. Uh, there are ways you can do fences that do not have to be horribly high. We can contact me if you're interested. And as far as ticks go, um, organic sprays are not tick selective. So they're not target specific. If you use an organic spray, you are killing desirable pollinators as well. You are the target, spray yourself, check yourself. It's the only actually effective way to prevent yourself from getting a, a tick-borne disease. And there is a tick, um, a, a non-toxic tick management spray that's fungal based that's in development and hopefully will be available in the next couple of years. Let's see, what else? Uh, simple software to, to draw garden plants. I'm not, I know they're out there, but they're not really something that we work in CAD, so it's not really on my radar. But if you want to email me, I could ask around. I can't say for sure it'll be particularly helpful. Um, maybe the APL Day, the, the Association, the American Association of Landscape Designers, um, they might be able to help you better than I. What do I think of sprinklers? And um, Spring, the only part of your lawn that really needs watering is lawn. The only part of your landscape that truly needs watering is lawn. And um, that's because lawn without watering can get stressed. Obviously you have to water responsibly. We're very much, um, uh, per, uh, what would you say? I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about the, uh, the iPhone based sprinkler systems. So there's no set it and forget it. But in terms of having plastic tubes all over your property with drip, I really do not suggest that is a viable uh, um, alternative. Drip for your vegetable garden is good. It's great. But other than that, um, just, just water your lawn and water it responsibly. Not often, as Tony said, and not early in the season. Get those roots down deep. Tough love. And Tim Pertel, I see you have a question and I guess I'll get back to you. I'm glad you're watching and I'll see you next week, maybe. Thank you, Edwina. Okay, bye.